Good evening and welcome to our important conversation regarding Seattle Public Schools levy renewals. As we're beginning to get settled, want to emphasize that we do have interpretation services available. As you're looking at your screen, the instructions on how to reach the interpretation services tonight are right there before you. If you are looking for the session in Amharic, please do take a look at our chat. The link is there. We will be starting officially in just one minute. Good evening, everyone, and I want to begin by welcoming you to the Seattle Public Schools conversation regarding our levies. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We are so pleased that you did spend the time this evening with us to emphasize the importance of our students and your support for our schools. We appreciate your willingness to engage in this important conversation this evening want to remind that we do have language interpretation services available this evening. So if you need this meeting in our top five languages, we do have that. Please take a look at the top of your screen or at the slide in front of you for those directions. If you are looking for this session in Amharic, please click and look inside of the Q&A chat for that link. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. Today is the second of three community levy forums and we're excited to share the details with you about our proposed levy renewals. We will have a recording of this presentation translated and available online. Tonight, we'll start by discussing our current budget climate and then walk through the specifics of our two levy proposals. First, the Educational Programs and Operations Levy, EPNO, and then second, Building Excellence BEC-6 Capital Levy Program. If these levies are approved by our school board on November 19th, they will go on to be on the February 11th, 2025 ballot. We will also answer questions at the end of the presentation. Please know that we are aware that school closures are top of mind for many of our families. We will attempt to answer as many of those questions as possible as they pertain to our budget as well as our levies at the end of the presentation. Let's talk about levies. Levies are those local property taxes that are approved by our voters for public schools. If these levies are approved, all of that funding supports Seattle schools and Seattle students. Please remember that these levies are not new taxes. They are renewals of expiring levies. An overview of the levies that we're going to discuss tonight. Educational Programs and Operations Levy, EPNO Renewal. It provides day-to-day -day operations for those things that are not fully funded by the state, such as staffing positions, special education, and programs and opportunities for students, such as athletics, drama, and art. The Capital Levy Renewal is our main source of funding for safety and security improvements, technology, school building replacement, 
renovation and repair. And please remember that if the school board approves on November 19th, the levy renewals will appear on the February 11th ballot. <clears throat> As we go on to the rest of our presentation, again, a reminder regarding our interpretation services. If you look at the top of your screen, you will see a drop down menu that would allow you to choose the, trans the interpretation services that you would like. If you're seeking Amharic, please do check our chat for that link. And now, to take us further into the presentation, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Kurt Buttleman, our Assistant Superintendent for Finance. Thank you, Bev. You're <clears throat> welcome. Did you introduce yourself? I didn't, but hey, <laughs> hey everybody, I am Bev Redmond, <laughs> Chief of Staff. Yeah, a fearless leader, thank you. Ah, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity tonight, and before we get into the specifics on the two levies we were discussing, we wanted to provide some context on how this ep levy request fits into the SPS larger budget picture. As many of you may be aware, school districts are funded through a combination of state, local, and federal dollars. Seattle Public Schools has budgeted $1.23 billion in resources for this current school year. Of that $1.23 billion, the state funds 63%. In this operations levy, the EP&O levy currently funds 15.6%. The levy portion, that 15.6%, 15 .6 is approximately $191 million. So it's an important resource for Seattle Public Schools. Seattle Public Schools is currently projecting a budget deficit of about $94 million for the 25-26 school year. Not this current year, but for the following year. This situation is unfortunately not unique to Seattle Public Schools as many other districts across the, state are, across the state are also struggling with these financial issues. It's a structural issue that, in that the needs of Seattle Public Schools students and families are exceeding the funding that is provided by the state. As we are all aware, the cost of living and doing business in Seattle continues to rise. Additionally, the needs of our community continue to grow. Security, special education services, multi-language services, and substitute teacher costs are just a few examples of where the state funding does not cover the needs of Seattle Public Schools and where the levy provides a, an enriching funding source. We'll get into some more detail on some of these items later in the presentation. What we've been doing recently to work on this funding deficit, over the last few years, we've been addressing the structural deficit issues and we will continue to work with state legislators and our other colleagues in the K-12 system to work to bring more stability into the system. Listed on this slide are a few examples of things Seattle Public Schools has done to mitigate the structural issue. You'll see that school consolidation is just one of the many strategies the district is employing to reduce costs. Additional solutions include the utilization of one-time strategies to mitigate or delay other significant reductions that directly impact schools and students. For people who are interested in doing a deep dive into this financial information, the Seattle Public Schools budget book, all 205 pages of it, can be found on the seattleschools.org website, bannering budget book into the search box. Also, please be aware that the school board will continue its budget discussions in the coming few months with formal adoption of a budget for the 25-26 school year scheduled for July of 2025. Transitioning to the main objective for this meeting tonight, which is to provide information related to the renewal of the existing EP&O operations levy and the BEC-6 levy. Keep in mind that these are both renewals of existing levies that will expire at the end of 2025. Let's get into some more detail on the EP&O levy now. The EP&O, or Operations Levy, is enrichment funding that helps continue funding for day-to-day -day educational programs and services that are not fully funded by the state of Washington. This amount is the $191 million that I mentioned earlier, or 15.6% of the total Seattle Public Schools budget. On this slide are a few examples of programs and services that are funded by the levy. Student safety and support, including salaries of staff, school security personnel, special education, and multilingual support staff. 
The other category is student services and programs. These categories ensure funding for special education, student healthy, healthy student meals, and student transportation services. The educational program and operation levy also provides student opportunities such as athletics, arts, music, and drama. I should have mentioned in my introduction that I'm a former parent of, or I'm a parent of two former students from Seattle Public Schools, both graduates of Ballard High School um, in Whittier, go Wildcats. Um, and they benefit from many of these um, opportunities that were provided by the education, educational programs and operations levy. There are restrictions on how school districts can use EP&O or operational levies and how they can collect from their constituent groups. We often get questions about why Seattle Public Schools can't just raise more money from Seattleites to fix these deficit problems or provide additional opportunities for students. This slide is a summary of what restrictions school districts in Washington State have on levying local taxes. There's a state law that limits the amount school districts may collect. In recent, in recent history, the McCleary decision also constrained what school districts can collect in their local levies. Seattle Public Schools is asking for the, the maximum amount allowed plus some additional capacity in case the state were to increase those levy restrictions. This extra amount would not be collected unless it is authorized by the state legislature. A few examples of how the levy funds services at Seattle Public Schools include security staff. The state's funding allocation money model or the funding that the state provides only provides for 9.3 full-time equivalent security specialists for a district like Seattle Public Schools. The needs at Seattle Public Schools are for 73 security specialists. This levy funds that difference of 63.7 security specialists. Another example of the funding gap is the state's funding allocation model only provides $150 million for special education services, which the district is mandated to provide. Although there have been recent increases to the state funding in recent years to meet the needs of some of our students, Seattle Public Schools is still funding approximately $74 million of this need from this EPNO levy. A third example is athletics. The district, Seattle Public Schools, spends approximately $5.5 million on athletics each year. None of that is funded by the state allocation, so all of the athletic program is funded by this EPNO levy. The cost of the educational programs and operation levy renewal is about $674 million over the next three years, the 26, 27, and 28 calendar years. And for an individual taxpayer or homeowner, those rate range, rates range between 70 and 65 cents per thousand dollars of assessed property value. I'm gonna pass it over to my friend Richard Best, Executive Director of Facilities, to talk about the building excellence Capital levy renewal. Thank you, Dr. Buttleman. Uh, again, Richard Best, Executive Director for Capital Projects and Planning, and, and I'm pleased to be able to come before you tonight to talk about <coughs> um, the BEC 6 capital levy. The BEC 6 capital levy is a six year levy and it alternates every three years with our building technology and academics levy. This is an expiring levy and it will fund security and uh, safety and security improvements throughout the district, Here, uh, heating and ventilation improvements throughout the district, replacements and renovations, uh, major renovations at five schools, and then again, energy conservation improvements throughout the district. In addition, the Bex levy provides approximately 90% of the Department of Technology Services technology funding. And so this is a very significant levy as well for Seattle Public Schools. The five major projects that are included in BEC 6 include Lowell Elementary School, which has been an elementary school within the Seattle Public School system since 1890 and has a portion of the building uh, at the existing site was constructed in 1919 that we anticipate will be landmarked by the city of Seattle. Uh, we'll be demolishing the remainder of that building and then building a new um, Lowell Elementary School and renovating the existing 1919 portion of that building. In addition, we're planning to construct a new elementary school 
in the Northeast region of Seattle, uh, make modernization and classroom addition improvements at Aki Kurosi Middle School in the Southeast portion of the Seattle, and then in West Seattle, uh, implement career and technical education and general education classroom addition at Chief South International High School. The career and technical education programs are overflowing with students at Chief South High School. And in addition, we have eight portables that we'd like to relocate from that site and move off. And so we want to build general ed education classrooms as part of that addition as well. And then the last major project planned in the BEC-6 capital levy is the modernization of John Marshall School. We'll be implementing seismic improvements and HVAC improvements at that, that school. In addition, we have numerous safety and security projects planned for Seattle Public Schools, including secure entry vestibules, building and site improvements, and perimeter fencing, intercom systems that will update in every school in the district so that we can provide emergency notifications from the John Stanford Center or from any location within Seattle Public Schools. We're also going to be implementing security system improvements that looks like security cameras, uh, door and window intrusion alarms, AI phones, um, and then fire alarm systems and seismic improvements. I'll note that the city of Seattle is updating their unreinforced masonry uh, regulations in 2025. All of our unreinforced mason, uh, uh, masonry uh, buildings will be looking at and <coughs> assessing, will be implementing uh, improvements to comply with those new regulations. This will take a period of a couple of levies to implement and comply with all of with the new regulations that we're anticipating in 2025. And then lastly, on the safety and security, we'll be replacing the defibrillators in all of our schools throughout Seattle Public Schools. Also an important part of the educational program is making sure that we have accessibility for all students. So we'll be implementing American with Disability Act improvements at um, numerous schools as well, and elevator improvements as well. And then would note that similar to the work that you do at your homes, uh, our school buildings need to be painted, our masonry buildings need to have a water repellent and anti-graffiti coating put on every 10 to 12 years. We have a list of projects that we're going to be completing in the Beck 6 levy that are similar to that. We'll be, placing, we'll be replacing some roofs. We'll be building some single occupant restrooms in our secondary schools. And then to comply with new legislation from the state of Washington concerning clean buildings, which is really fo uh, focused on energy conservation, we'll be making lighting upgrades and HVAC improvements at several of our schools as well. And one of the things I'm most proud about in my tenure here at Seattle Public Schools is our playgrounds. We have implemented a playground safety and, uh, and replacement program in which our playgrounds are scheduled for repairs and replacement every 15 years. And we're addressing, um, again, some additional um, schools on this as part of our um, ongoing play, playground replacement project. And lastly, I doubt that part of the significant work is um, improvements to our John Stanford Center kitchen in which we'll be implementing phase three, the last phase of these of this uh, work in the kitchen. Um, I'll note that the kitchen serves um, approximately 65 elementary schools and 10 K-8 schools, half the student population, so 25,000 students out of that uh, one facility located here at the John Stanford Center. So other improvements um, in the levy are some, we're beginning the design studies of flood mitigation at Nathan Hale High School. We have an issue in which Thornton Creek on occasion, when we get heavy uh, storms, floods both the interior courtyard and the parking lot. We're trying to understand 
um, from an environmental standpoint, how to mitigate that. And then we have money in this levy for the interior build out of Rainier Beach High School's Performing Arts Center. That was a, a BEX-5 project. And as many of you know, we've uh, experienced a significant escalation period. That was a bid alternate that we did not award when we awarded the project to lighted construction. So there are ongoing um, maintenance um, and food service items as well, but uh, we've included um, equipment funding for our maintenance, food service, and grounds department. And you can see the broader list on our levy website. And so with that, I'd just like to take a moment to note how the projects are selected. We utilize a third party independent uh, facilities condition to salt, uh, consultant to implement an assessment of our facilities once every six years. We utilize that data then to prioritize the projects. The board then gives us some guiding principles and we look at the board policy. We assign a priority number to that project and then we work with our um, accounting and budget offices to establish what the levy amount um, could be trying to keep the levy amount consistent with prior levies. And so we made an initial recommendation with, uh, to our school board on October 9th of 2024 of what should be included in the BEC-6 capital levy. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Carlos De Valle, who will talk about the BEC-6 BEC technology portion of the capital levy. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Carlos De Valle, Assistant Superintendent of Technology for the district. Let me speak a little bit about the uh, technology piece of this. Um, as Richard mentioned earlier, um, this levy funds about 90% of uh, SPS technology budget. This translates uh, about a 127 FTEs. Uh, it's basically how we pay for keeping the lights on for technology across the district. You know, networks, data, um, systems, software, um, students and, 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 and staff computers, the classroom technology, um, uh, developing and implementation and digital curriculum. We, we, we are very heavy in, the, in this now. Uh, upgrades to digital systems and upgrades to cybersecurity systems to keep uh, our, our kids and data privacy. And then uh, very heavily looking into equity access to inclusive digital resources, such as language support systems of all online libraries. Also, we're doing some investments on, on safety and security, uh, such as uh, cameras as well. With that, we did an analysis across the district, and um, we came out to be about 415 million over a three-year uh, uh, period. We, we actually, uh, assess these investments in three major areas, student learning and support, infrastructure and security, and district systems and data. Let me go a little bit into these. Uh, student uh, learning and support, uh, this portion of the, le the levy covers for technical support staff to provide for repairs and logistics of equipment at the schools. Also, these funds provide for digital learning support, purchasing of instructional software and licenses, procurement uh, of a student laptops and all the associated staff that provides uh, in this area. Infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, security, this portion of the levy provides for operational costs of running the data center, uh, the backbone infrastructure. It provides also for cybersecurity monitoring systems, surface software licenses, operations and equipment of hardware and maintenance. Uh, we pay the internet connectivity from here as well and the telephone service and all the associated staff to support this area. And finally, the uh, district systems and data, this portion of the levy covers uh, for software systems developers, analysts, and the feed and care of our business and financial systems, so, such as the uh, ERP, SAP, HR systems. Uh, our learning management systems uh, includes uh, Schoology, CSOC, uh, and our student information systems, uh, such as the Atlas database uh, that hosts all our student data, um, our Microsoft uh, Teams for Education, 
empower schools. It also includes hardware and uh, software applications uh, and licenses, consultants and vendors that, that, that provide for skill sets that we don't have internally, and all the associated staff that uh, provide for this area. With that, um, the total capital levy is $1.8 billion uh, uh, over six years for all projects, including the technology funding. This translates to a, a, a rate ranges uh, between 93 cents and 79 cents per 1,000 of assessed property value over six, uh, six years of the levy. With that, I'm gonna pass it back to Kurt. Thank you, Carlos. We wanna provide a little context for how Seattle Public Schools levy rate uh, compares to surrounding school districts. So on the next slide, you'll see Seattle Public Schools levy rates are the lowest in the uh, neighboring communities. And this is in large part because of the high assessed value of the commercial properties in Seattle and the fact that they are paying a significant portion of this levy. Um, as we have said, this is a renewal of existing levies. These, this data on this slide reflects the current reality um, of property owners paying $1.85 for $1,000 of assessed value. And it includes the BTA levy, which is a, another levy that Seattle Public Schools enjoys um, that has a four-year levy. And for comparison purposes, if the levies being discussed tonight were approved by voters in February and added to the BTA levy, it would be $2.04 um, for $1,000 of assessed value starting in the 2026 year. I think we're back to you, Chief Redmond. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this important conversation regarding our levies. And we've reached the Q&A portion of this particular session. So, Kurt, Richard, Carlos, you ready? So ready. All right, let's answer some questions. Uh, we do have our audience there, as well as maybe a couple of media partners out there. So we want to make sure that we are answering questions from our community this evening. Kurt, why does Seattle Public Schools need local levies to fund education? So that's a common question. Um, the levy does bridge the gap between what the state provides and what the community needs at a school district like Seattle, which is not unique on this point. Um, in short, it helps us provide a higher quality education than the state would provide otherwise without the levies, provide some of these additional resources that are needed by our community. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and let's move on. Uh, Carlos, how does the technology portion of the levy support students in our schools? What is the levy funding used for in that instance? So we, we have a lot of investments in looking into replacing uh, all technology in the classroom, uh, what we call the tech refresh. Uh, we have a lot of uh, audiovisual that is being uh, older that needs replacement. So we're gonna be doing investments on that area. That, that includes like uh, uh, the projectors up in the, you know, on the ceilings, you know, the, uh, the, the, the boards, uh, computers in the classroom, um, systems like in, in, in CTE uh, classrooms, there's specialized equipment. Uh, we're going to be investing in that. Also, we're investing in some of the uh, um, management tools for educators, uh, the software management, classroom management software, uh, to, to be a little bit more agile on their, um, on their environment. Thank you for that. And Richard. If schools slated for closure are included in the current levy proposal, will funds be reallocated for projects at other schools? So if, if there are projects that are, uh, where schools will be closed through the consolidation process, um, those funds would be fenced and then uh, capital projects and planning would need to go to the school board to get approval to reallocate those funds for other projects. But I will also note that, you know, there are, uh, we'll want to maintain the investments we've made in those schools. If there's uh, areas of potentially consequential damages, for an example, if your roof is leaking and it's gonna damage the interior of that facility, we'll definitely wanna make those types of improvements, roof repair improvements to maintain that asset until the school board has the opportunity to have a conversation 
with the community about what to implement or what to do with those assets. So yes, uh, those dollars could be reallocated, but they're reallocated with school board approval. And we'll have to look at the long-term maintenance portions of those closed resources as well, because they do represent assets to Seattle Public Schools. Okay, thank you, Richard. We're gonna stay with you for just a bit and focus on BEX-5. What are the results of the BEX-5 levy? Both what was done and what hasn't been done. Are there any projects that weren't finished? Okay, so this is a, a great question and one I appreciate. Um, it really reflects well on the staff, um, for the capital project staff. But in 2021, we re, uh, completed a 12 classroom addition at West Woodland Elementary School. Uh, in 2022, uh, we completed an eight classroom addition at James Madison Middle School and a four classroom addition at Leshi Elementary School. And then in the spring of 2023, we completed the uh, seismic improvements and the envelope improvements, plus the renovation of the Performing Arts Center at Lincoln High School. And really, um, as that was a phase two project in which we focused on the East buildings at Link on the Lincoln High School campus. Phase one focused on the uh, landmarked uh, buildings on the west side of that campus. And then in the fall of 2023, we opened Kimball Elementary School, James Baldwin Elementary School, and Viewlands Elementary School, all as replacement projects, and a 12 classroom addition at West Seattle Elementary School. In addition, we modernized uh, North Queen Anne School for the Cascade Parent Partnership. Um, currently under construction, we have um, Montlake Elementary School and John Rogers Elementary School that will open in the fall of 2025. Asa Mercer International Middle School that will open in the fall of 2025. And then Rainier Beach High School that will open in the spring of 2025, phase three, but phase four and phase five will extend into 2026. And that project will finally be complete in November of 2026. Uh, in addition, Alki Elementary School was another major project uh, that was proposed in the BEX-5 capital levy. That too will open in the fall of 2026. Um, those were the major projects that were proposed in the um, BEX-5 capital levy. We also provided uh, design funding for Sacagawea Elementary School, which we have paused while we were go engaged in the well-resourced school conversation. And we provided design funding for Aki Kurosi Middle School. So the Aki Kurosi Middle School, what we're looking for in the BEX-6 capital levy are the construction dollars to complete that project. <clears throat> Besides all of the major work that we've been working on, we've also implemented, I'm gonna say, tens of smaller projects throughout Seattle Public Schools. And what that looks like is roof replacements, athletic field improvements. Um, if you drove by Nathan Eckstein Middle School this summer, you saw that we were replacing the windows there. We have a... Um, and literally tens of projects have been implemented in the BEX-5 capital list um, since its passage in 2019. Great. Thank you for that thorough answer. And Kurt, we're gonna turn in terms of the topics and move into security. Can you explain what security specialists are? Yes. Uh... I'm glad for the question because that's their job title. These are the folks that are in the school building helping the, super, or the principal and the teachers maintain a positive school environment. They're the folks you see in the hallway on campus connecting with kids. They're also the folks who are responding to emergencies and situations, security situations in schools. Um, they're just sort of the stable presence in the schools providing 
a secure environment and knowing how to access resources that are needed. Um, in thinking about this question, uh, as you asked it, uh, my, my son would come home from Robert Eagle staff and talk about the security specialist. He didn't use that job title, but the guy that he hung out with at recess. And so they provide this uh, additional support for students in many different ways. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, my dad was a security specialist was, for many, many years, so I greatly appreciate that presence. Did I hit for the sure. mark on what he did? Or uh, you did. Was trying to do yeah. okay. <laughs> yes, it did. Building those relationships with students yeah. and definitely taking a watchful eye around the campus yeah. for sure. Oh. For those of you who would like to submit a question, please do remember to check out our chat, type those. We are watching, we're taking a look at those and we will be able to uh, answer those as we go along. So, Richard, your next step. <clears throat> what land will you need to buy in Bex 6? Um, we've got uh, property acquisition dollars included in Bex 6. We don't have land des uh, that we are um, pursuing at this moment in time. Um, but not to have those property acquisition dollars uh, prevents us from acquiring land. And, uh, and we leave those dollars fenced for um, property acquisition. We do not spend those dollars in any other manner. Um, we are currently spending BEX $5 for property acquisition. With the uh, replacement of Memorial Stadium, um, we had our surplus warehouse underneath the South Bleacher Stands. Um, that will not be possible when the new build, when the new structure is built. And so we had to purchase property for uh, a new surplus warehouse that we're combining with a capital warehouse that we currently lease so that we no longer have to implement those uh, annual expenditures for leasing warehouse space. So we're combining, we purchased one facility um, in the spring of 2024. We'll be implementing some improvements to that to make it work for our surplus and capital warehouse. And that is intended to open in May of 2025. And that supports our Memorial Stadium replacement um, project. Thank you, Richard. I just want to make a correction to something that I said. I indicated that our chat was where you should submit your questions. It is actually the Q&A feature. Please put your questions in the Q&A feature and we will be able to address those in that way. Richard, you mentioned Memorial Stadium. What's the current status? Uh, we are working with the City of Seattle and the One Roof Foundation on the design at this moment in time for Memorial Stadium. I uh, hope to be submitting for permits approximately the first of the year and hope to be getting construction in the summer of 2025 on Memorial Stadium. There's still processes that we need to go through, but we are working diligently on Memorial Stadium. That diligent work, going to Kurt, next question for you. EPNO levy, why don't we just increase it to help our deficit? Can't we just ask the voters to approve all the funding we need to operate schools that way? So we are restricted by state law, current state law on what we can collect. Seattle Public Schools does collect um, the maximum allowed by that state law. And we do, Seattle Public Schools does traditionally ask for a little bit of buffer or extra capacity um, when they go out to the levy voters for this in the chance that the state will change the law and allow for more collection of local levy taxes um, to more adequately fund the schools. And so Seattle Public Schools will be, or the superintendent will be recommending to the school board to increase that capacity, to allow for that capacity in this levy um, proposal that he's making to the school board in November and that would allow for any changes to state law to allow uh, for Seattle voters to pay um, more to fund their schools than currently allowed by state law. We do not collect it unless it's approved by the state, but the voters have traditionally given the Seattle Public Schools that authority. Well, we appreciate that support and that care 
and that consistent advocacy for public schools from our community, for sure. Carlos. Uh, this question says, I'm surprised the levy funds so much of technology. What happens if we don't pass this? Do we not have any funding for technology? Why does the state, why doesn't the state fund tech? I think that would be, Claire, I think that would be more suitable for you to answer the question. You can talk about some of the things From your we experience. Fund. Mm -hmm. Well, from my experience, I mean, we, we're talking, what we're talking here is about keeping the lights on for the district's backbone data centers, mm -hmm. data, your digital resources, um, um, anything that has to do with, with the, the curriculum is, is in there, you know, our student systems, everything is there. So we're, we're seeing that if the levy doesn't pass, we're, we're gonna be in, in quite of a, a trick, um, I would say. Um, there's an opportunity, right, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, you know, to, uh, to bring it back in April, if I'm, I'm a second. I've right. heard. Yeah. And if the state, if if the levy did not pass and the technology portion was not funded, the the repercussions of that would be reductions in other parts of the district. And so, mm -hmm. to fund those technology need technology needs, the state does provide some funding, but not near the amount that Seattle Public Schools needs for its community. And so, there'd be reductions in the services and technology, and there'd be reductions elsewhere within the district's budget to offset those necessary technology costs. So it's a good reminder that this is also enrichment funding. So some of the things, the one-to-one -one laptops and devices in schools is funded by this levy. Um, those are things that would probably not be possible without a levy like this. That's great. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that uh, the board is scheduled to vote uh, to approve this on November 19th. If that is approved there, it will go on to the ballot on February 11th. Richard, <clears throat> question regarding Catherine Blaine facility. I understand that the neglected Catherine Blaine facility was supposed to be improved with funds from BEX-5. Are these improvements still planned now that Catherine Blaine no longer, is no longer scheduled to be closed? Yes, those improvements are um, still planned for Catherine Blaine. Um, all funds that are in a levy remain fenced for the purpose that they were intended to be utilized because the board has approved that levy and the board has approved the implementation plan. We do not shift funds for any one project unless we go back to the board and um, get their approval to shift it to another project. What we will do on occasion, as we were engaged in the well-resourced schools uh, conversation, is we'll put a pause, but the funding remains with the project and the board, uh, and, and so the, Catherine, the improvements that were planned for Catherine Blaine K-8 will be implemented. Okay. And, and we have staff currently working on the design, and I know we are in the process of bidding the electrical improvements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard and Carlos, uh, I believe this question could be shared with both of you. Uh, you mentioned committees that review projects. Can you say more? I'll open it up to everyone. But I can start with, okay. with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we collect the requirements, we take a look at uh, requirements for technology we're taking uh, a look at all sectors of the district. So we go out and we ask to uh, functionals um, and uh, also uh, educational technologists uh, out in, in the classroom. These are educators that help us identify requirements. We collect these requirements and we bring them to the Information Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, this is a committee that was um, founded back in 2019, I believe, uh, and it's composed of uh, nine members of the community and industry, uh, nine members of staff, uh, and also three uh, students. Um, and when we go, you know, we bring these this investments and um, they, they give us feedback, uh, they give us what, you know, a feel for where the community, you know, is leaning and some uh, of these solutions that we bring forward to, to the district. Uh, the information technology uh, is a, uh, a one-year uh, volunteer assignment uh, with the option to continue two years. Um, and we put the, uh, the application, I believe it's in July that we put it in. 
uh, for people to 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 apply uh, uh, if we have the uh, the selectees uh, sometime in October when we have our first uh, yearly meeting. So I encourage anybody to apply when these uh, uh, applications go out in July, please. And then uh, we have the Bex BTA uh, Capital Oversight Committee that oversees the implementation of the Bex and the BTA levies and. Capital Projects and Planning meets with them on a monthly basis to explain where we are on the status of projects that are currently under design, currently um, under construction. Um, we go, we spend the first part of the meeting reviewing the um, Bex 5 and the BTA 5 financials. Um, then we spend the next part of the meeting reviewing the uh, providing a project update, and then invariably they have asked for a special, you know, a topic that we spend an hour, the second portion of the meeting on. This is a committee that's comprised of 11, 11 um, subject matter experts in the field of design and construction. We have architects, engineers, um, contractors, uh, construction attorneys, and developers that all sit on this committee and provide guidance to um, Seattle Public Schools capital project staff as to the implementation of the levy. Um, they provided great guidance over the past couple of years with the uh, significant um, inflationary period that we saw and um, have worked really with this committee um, since BEX 1 back in 1995. Uh, that was uh, uh, a requirement to have a public oversight committee when we passed BEX 1, and we are continuing that tradition. They are great advisors um, and to capital projects and planning staff. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, and this is school closure related. A lot of money was spent on plans rebuilding Sacagawea and now the district wants to close the school. At the same time, the new levy includes money for a new elementary school. This particular commenter says, it all feels very counterintuitive and wasteful. What are the plans for that? Mm -hmm. So I would just note that in the Bex 5 capital levy, we had $4 million allocated for the design of Sacagawea Elementary School. We have spent less than four hundred thousand um, dollars of that those funds. That was initially for conceptual planning for the architect, for some surveys, for some environmental work at Sacagawea Elementary School. Um, four hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, and I will I recognize that. But these are investments on the scale of. I'm gonna say 80 to $100 million, and we need to get the selection of the school correct. When we went before the voters in 2019, Seattle Public Schools student enrollment was growing. And with, since the COVID pandemic, we have lost students um, each year since uh, reopening after, you know, after the COVID pandemic and lost our students at elementary schools. It's made um, the academic program, capital projects, capital planning, all reassess where we're headed with our elementary schools. We're working closely with our counterparts in finance and the budget office because we're facing a budget problem. And so we know that the inventory in Northeast Seattle, we have some older schools that require um, uh, renovation or replacement in Northeast Seattle when the well-resourced school closure comes to a conclusion and we know what the inventory is gonna look like for elementary schools in Northeast Seattle, we, we will be working with the academic to make a recommendation to the school board. So at this moment in time, we are saying a uh, new uh, a replacement elementary school, it will not be a new school, but a replacement elementary school in Northeast Seattle. Okay. 
believe we have a question regarding capacity and construction. Uh, a lot of capacity was added with construction of new schools. What is the district's plan for boundary adjustments to use this capacity? It seems like closures will be used to fill these new buildings instead of boundary adjustments. So um, I would note that Seattle Public Schools has approximately 300 portables that serve our student needs. And a lot of, while we are creating additional capacity, we're creating that additional capacity because we're looking for the, uh, to the future for the next 75 to 100 years with the school facilities that we're building. We would love to um, not have portables on site because they pose a safety risk. Um, and so we're trying to eliminate portables from our site uh, from our sites. And so we're looking at um, creating capacity and then shutting down portions of a building or utilizing portions of a building in different manners, maybe in partnership with early learning, partnership with community organizations that provide support to our students, in partnership with community health that could provide health care for our students. So there's lots of um, area, uh, ways in which we can utilize um, these portions of the building that may not be fully utilized at the time they're built. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we are headed toward our last question. If you have a question remaining, we have a few more minutes, so please do get your questions in the Q&A function there. Wow, oh, Richard, <clears throat> you're popular tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, clean energy. How do you make sure that SPS is moving toward clean energy? What green projects are included in BEC 6? Well, we are looking at, um, with the work that we're proposing at the uh, um, re replacement schools, we're looking at installing geothermal wells. We're looking at available funding that might, that uh, would be available for those clean energy improvements through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I will note that the state of Washington has, has passed what they, uh, a piece of legislation called the Clean Buildings Performance Standards. Um, Seattle Public Schools needs to comply with those standards or will pay a penalty for not complying, which will exacerbate our budget issues in the general fund. So we're looking at lighting improvements at a, at a I'm gonna say, a significant portion of our schools. And then um, we're looking at also um, installation of some solar arrays at the schools in which will be um, uh, part of the major work in the BEX five or BEX six capital levy. Um, that's a code requirement from the city of Seattle. I'll also note that the city of Seattle has a code, code requirement regarding building emissions. We're analyzing that now to look at compliance. Uh, we believe we'll be in compliance through 2030 and then are gonna have to be making some improvements to address uh, in, uh, compliance um, at our, our infrastructure as well um, for that piece of legislation. But we believe we're in compliance now with that but we are looking long-term to make sure that we're in compliance. And then I'll note that the board passed a resolution that requires that uh, our buildings be fossil-free by 2040. We are on a pathway to be fossil-free by 2040 with the implementation of this levy. But again, it's not all in this levy. They'll be following levies that will be um, addressing um, clean energy requirements as well. I'm going to let you rest your voice <laughs> just a second. That was our last question. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening for our levy conversation. You have another opportunity to see our group again on November 7th. We have another online community meeting coming your way, 6.30 p.m. And also remember, November 19th, the school board will place, uh, will is scheduled to vote on placing this on the ballot. If, if approved on that night, it will go on to 
the ballot on February 11th. We're also planning to host some informational meetings for our PTSAs, so please look for us there as well. But on behalf of Kurt, Richard, Carlos, you all smile, <laughs> and myself, thank you so much for joining us. Be well.